Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 34th episode of Tissues of the Day, a comedy show about queer culture and relationships. I'm your host, David, and Robert is eight hours ahead of me right now. So for him, it is like just just the butt crack of dawn. So he is not co-hosting right now. And we are joined today by our special guest, Sasha Rockcliffe. Welcome, Sasha. Hello. And Crumbs is here with me as well. And Crumbs, my boyfriend, my temporary boyfriend. <laughs> um Today's episode is about attachment theory. And uh, yeah, Sasha is, how do we want to describe this? You're studying counseling? I am, yeah, I'm a master's of counseling psychology student. So um, by no means an expert on attachment theory, but I have studied it a little bit and um, I'm very interested in the topic too. Nice, same. Uh, you can follow Sasha at Sasha.Rockcliffe on Instagram. She'll often repost wellness content on her stories. Uh, as we get started, remember there's video of the podcast on the Bitbutton YouTube channel and audio wherever you get podcasts. Uh, so Sasha, when did attachment theory enter your life? Um, Just the concept in general. <laughs> when I was in the womb. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> uh, so I did my undergrad in child and youth care over a decade ago, a very long time ago. Um, so a big part of that was studying lifespan development. And of course, attachment was a part of that. Um, yeah, so that's when I first started learning about it. And then I think it's just been in the past like five years or so that it's really became like a part of mainstream culture. Um, and I'm learning how that applies to adulthood as well. Whereas like when I was learning about an undergrad, it was very much focused on infants and children. And now as we know, it's something that carries with us throughout the lifespan. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Very cool. So what year would you say that was when you were uh, in your undergrad? 2011. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, it was in 2016. I can't remember if it was like, it was one of the first, if not the first session I had with my therapist that she recommended reading Attached by Amr Levin or Levine and Rachel Heller. Um, and we started talking about attachment theory and it like, it was blowing my mind. I was like, is that me? <laughs> um, with all of their like descriptions and stuff. And it was super helpful. So, um, why would we say attachment theory is important? Like, why do you think it's caught on so much? And like, just, yeah. Why has it like stood the test of time? <laughs> I think, I mean, it's obviously these early attachment relationships are something that shape our social and emotional development from a very early age. And yeah, I think it's really caught on because people want to understand their behaviors. Like, why am I the way that I am? And why do my relationships follow this pattern? Um, and so just being able to like pinpoint that and explore that and explore those early attachment relationships and the impact that they've had on our present selves. I think that's really interesting for people. And everybody's just obsessed with understanding more about themselves. So, yeah, yeah, relatable. Because um, recently on Instagram, I posted like a bunch of book recommendations over this past year, and like I put attached on there. And my little like uh, caption on the thing was attachment theory is like astrology, but it's consistent and based on research. <laughs> um, so it's hey, a little don't better. hate on astrology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being cheeky because you do like astrology. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So um, before we get into like an overview of the four types, uh, like Sasha said, this is meant to be just like introductory, just like a very general thing. Um, I highly recommend that you read Attached if you want like more info and all of these like, I don't know, signifiers of different styles and like ways to handle them. Um, and in the, like, before we get into that discussion, Sasha, what is your attachment style? So right now I would like to think that it's secure. Um, okay. it definitely has not always been that way. I think when I met my current partner, Cass, who has been on this podcast before, I was more in the avoidant side of things. Okay. Um, and it's taken a lot of yeah, just personal work and communication and building trust to like move from that avoidant to more secure. Um, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> what about okay. yourself? Uh, for me, I'm disorganized. 
um, or fearful avoidant, however, like whatever nomenclature people are using, uh, which is basically a combination of anxious and avoidant, depending on the day, <laughs> depending on how healthy I am. Um, but like, uh, we can cut this out if you want, feel free not to answer. Um, I remember when you and Cass were first dating that like I was talking to Cassidy about attachments, I think, and she was saying she related a lot to the avoidant style as well. Was that your experience? Like, were you <laughs> were you girls avoiding each other a little bit? <laughs> I think she was more on the anxious end of the spectrum oh, and okay. I was on the avoidant, okay. Um, okay. which is definitely not ideal. Uh, no. No. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to make a note. We we sh definitely should talk about that unless it's in your slides. Is it? Uh, I don't think it's in the slides, but we can definitely talk about that. Okay. I'm obsessed. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So I'm going to turn it over to Sasha because she has been a champ and prepared slides to talk to us <laughs> about attachment theory. Um, so just big picture. What is attachment theory, Sasha? Yeah. So this is going to be a total introduction. Um, I don't want it to be a lecture. There are, mm -mm. like you said, tons of great books, articles, other videos that you can watch that will explain it a lot better. But this will just give you like a very baseline entry point. Um, yeah. I should just pull up my slides too so I know what you're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so attachment theory was first formulated by John Bowlby, who was a psychoanalyst. Um, and he believed that the earliest bonds formed by young children with their caregivers have a significant impact on their social and emotional development, like we talked about earlier. So through his research, um, he did a lot of research with, um, yeah, just separation anxiety between infants and their caregivers, and then would introduce strangers into scenarios and see how the infants responded um, both to their caregiver and to their stranger. And he was able to kind of pinpoint three different styles of attachment that showed up. So they're secure, anxious or sometimes referred to as ambivalent and avoidant. And then in later years, other researchers eventually added a fourth attachment style, which is disorganized, David. <laughs> and um, Double D, disorganized <laughs> David. <laughs> uh, yeah, so our, our early attachment styles and the care that we receive from our primary caregivers influence the relationships that we now engage in as adults, um, and particularly our intimate and romantic relationships. So we're going to just quickly touch on what that looks like in infants. Um, I borrowed this from a website, integratedtraumatherapy.com.au. Um, so it just shows you a little breakdown of how these different attachment styles appear in infants. So with secure attachment, the caregiver is very sensitive to the needs of their infant. They're able to meet those basic needs, um, food, shelter, attention, all of that. Um, and so the child learns that their, care, their caregiver will be there to meet those needs um, and they learn to trust them. And so they have this, as, this kind of safe base to explore their environment and just grow and develop socially and emotionally. Um, so in Bowlby's studies, when the caregiver would leave, the infant would become distressed. But when they would come back, they would be like more positive and happy um, and they would have a, a positive reunion. Whereas in avoidant attachment, um, the caregiver doesn't always uh, meet the needs, is kind of like distant, sometimes neglectful. Um, and so the child then doesn't come to believe that their caregiver is going to be able to meet those needs and they don't form a strong, secure attachment. So in their experiments, when the, the caregiver would actually leave the child, um, they often wouldn't show any signs of distress. And when they came back, they wouldn't really show any interest when the caregiver returned either. Um, do you have any questions so far? I'm just like going to breeze uh, through this real quick. <laughs> no, I, I love this. I feel like I remember with, um, with avoidant attachment specifically, they would do like follow-up studies for that um, with actual, you know, whatever, like neural connections, whatever they use to measure brain activity. And like, even though the child may not show particular emotions, it could still be like experiencing those emotions. Is that accurate? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so if you're interested in any of the studies, like honestly, a Google search can pull up so much information. Um, but I think since we're talking mostly about adult relationships today, I'll just like yeah. quickly breeze through this um, just yeah. to give a little bit of background info. Yeah. Um, oh, hi, buddy. 
Sorry, he just woke up. <laughs> uh, so anxious or also known as ambivalent attachment. Um, in this case, the caregiver is sometimes consistent or is, is inconsistent, sometimes sensitive to the needs of the infant and sometimes neglectful. Um, so the infant can't really rely on having their needs met um, and they may exhibit behaviors such as more frequent crying um, and less exploration. You'll see like little temper tantrums um, and a lot of fear and anxiety around strangers as well. Um, so in the, in the experiments, when the child was um, separated from their caregiver, they were very, very distressed. But then when they would return, they would kind of resist contact. They would push them away. They wouldn't show interest, almost as if to like punish the caregiver for leaving. Um, and then in disorganized, I don't know if you want to jump in here, David, and, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, share what you the, know about that. <laughs> the caregiver, well, on this uh, chart, it goes the caregiver um, is often frightened or frightening. They are passive or intrusive. They are dissociated or extremely erratic. Um, just wild. It's just a wild home environment, um, which uh, tracks for me. So, uh, and uh, I don't know if you've heard this, Sasha, but like, I think there was one website, I don't know if it's still around, that related all of these attachment styles to pets. Have you heard of this? Oh, no, I haven't. I love that. So though. they go, <laughs> so they go, um, secure attachment is an adult dog, avoidant attachment is a cat, um, anxious attachment is a puppy, uh, and they don't have one for disorganized. What? <laughs> Can we think of one right now? A what bird. Would disorganize? I'm just, I'm a thinking bird. of a bird. That's all I can picture. <laughs> yeah. Just yelling. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Um, okay. Awesome. Uh, what can we say about secure adults? We have some bullet points here. Yeah. So secure adults, um, they experience low anxiety, low avoidance. Um, they're more comfortable with being close and affectionate with others, and they're also okay with being alone. They're good at communicating their needs and also being sensitive to the needs of others um, and can really engage in healthy conflict and problem solve in relationships. So this is kind of like the ideal of where we all want to be, but obviously yeah. because of our early experiences, it's just like, it's not always possible. Um, so yeah. then on the yeah. other hand, like anxious and or preoccupied adults have high anxiety, low avoidance. Um, so they're kind of what we think of as like the clingy partner. They need a lot of closeness and intimacy from their partner. Um, they may need a lot of reassurance. Uh, they may have a hard time being on their own and they can be like very hyper attuned to any changes in their partner's moods or behaviors or tone of voice. Um, and then also respond um, sometimes in quite like extreme ways to that. And they often also fear abandonment or rejection. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we all do, but yes, especially <laughs> the anxious type yeah. um, and avoidant. So avoidant or dismissing, and this is me historically, uh, low anxiety, high avoidance, um, very independent. So they don't really like to depend on others or have others really depend on them. Um, they may have difficulty communicating their needs in their relationship because they're just used to meeting their own needs. And therefore, they're also not really attuned to the needs of their partners. Um, they may be uncomfortable with closeness and intimacy, and they may pull away in relationships, especially when they do feel it progressing to a more serious stage or their partner is moving in closer or wanting to take other steps in the relationship. And they may create distance um, so they may also struggle to find satisfaction in relationships and make a choice or feel that they're better off just being on their own. Totally. There's a great example in Attached that goes like there will be avoidant relationships that could go on for years without putting like a label on it. <laughs> yes. Yes, very much so. <laughs> and um, then, yeah. Next. Go ahead. Yeah. Finally, we have disorganized or fearful avoidant adults. They want to belong and be loved, but also at the same time, they're afraid of getting hurt. So they're afraid of letting others in. I don't know if this resonates for you at all, but. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, so they don't necessarily oh, yeah, we'll get into like. It. <laughs> <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> this is just the intro. Yeah. So they don't necessarily reject intimacy, but they may fear it. They may fear letting others in um, and getting close to them because they don't necessarily believe that somebody could love them exactly for who they are. 
Um, so they kind of have that negative view of themselves and others, and they expect rejection, hurt, and disappointment um, before they really have any indication that's, that's going to happen. So they may end up self-sabotaging or ending relationships prematurely. Incredible. <laughs> Quiet round of applause for Sasha. Thank you for preparing these. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to put another graphic on the screen that is that basically sums all of these up um, that Sasha referred to, that there are basically two axes of avoidance and anxiety. And uh, depending on what your style is, you can actually like map out how avoidant you are, how anxious you are, and about where that lands for your attachment style. I think it's like a really elegant way of thinking about these things. Um, and with all of them, uh, would you agree, Sasha, that they are um, they are changeable? Or like, I, I think um, Heller and Levine use the terms like they're stable, but plastic. Like yes. you might revert to them in certain cases, but like you can work on it. Definitely. Yeah, I wouldn't okay. say they're fixed. Um, I mean, it's it's tricky depending on the circumstances. Like if you experienced, for instance, developmental trauma at an early age and as a result developed an avoidant attachment style, then that might run a lot deeper um, than let's say an attachment injury that occurs in adulthood, like having a partner cheat on you or something that could also change your attachment style. Um, yeah, but nothing is nothing is entirely fixed, like through therapy, through different interventions that help strengthen attachment and work on communication with your partner. Um, I think there is room for everybody to move from one style to another and maybe even to secure. Awesome. Yeah. Um, cool. So uh, before we start talking a bit about like our personal lives, um, I also wanted to mention activating and deactivating strategies. Is that a term that you would use as well? Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely heard that term before. Okay, cool. So um, in my limited experience. Um, an activating strategy is anything that is about seeking closeness with a partner. And a deactivating strategy is anything about uh, creating distance from a partner. Um, so anxious types are more prone to activating strategies. And there's like a whole list of them uh, that you can read in the books. <laughs> and um, avoidant types are more prone to deactivating strategies. Um, and what I find really interesting about those is like, self-concept and then the concept of the person they're in the relationship with. So anxious types really tend to idealize their partner, while um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, avoidant types really tend to idealize themselves and like d emphasize the negative traits of their partner. Yeah. Is that um, common? <laughs> or perhaps like not even view their partner negatively, but just view like depending on another person and... Um... Yeah. yeah, that that codependency they really I mean, I viewed that negatively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um so with all of those, I also want to mention too there's like this is like totally a tangent. We're not going to go very far down this, but like there is something very um uh something that's helped me is like applying concepts of Buddhism to attachment styles because uh, Buddhism is very much about like impermanence and thinking about our attachments, like just to the world in general. And so much of uh, what Buddhism talks about is like our suffering comes from fear and craving. Um, so like if like we could say that avoidant attachment is like pretty fearful and we could say anxious attachment is very craving, like and ultimately, like when we have a better relationship with our like fears and our desires like we do get to a more secure place so like i do highly recommend people like have a spiritual view of their relationships and like how they try to go through the world because like it's all love baby <laughs> <laughs> like that's really what this is about like it sounds pretty clinical but you know ultimately this is about us knowing how to love better would you agree sasha definitely i love that holistic perspective and if you ever go to grad school there's your thesis. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, at the very least, it'll be an essay on a blog. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to touch on the anxious avoidant trap. Uh, I don't know if you have a different name for it, Sasha, but would you be able to explain a bit what that is? Uh, so when an anxious person and an avoidant person end up in a relationship, is that what you're yep. referring to? Yep. Uh, okay. <laughs> 
I think the best way to just sum it up is that relationship will be a lot of push and pull and neither partner will be satisfied unless they make a conscious decision to work on their issues together. So they identify their attachment styles and figure out how to communicate with one another to ensure that those needs are being met. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, when Cass and I first started dating, we were both kind of like on opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, I'll share a story. She's sitting there. She could probably hear me <laughs> and might kill me for sharing this story. But <laughs> Yes. Oh, yes. I have like characters in the podcast. Now. <laughs> so, but we can cut it if she wants. That's also okay. <laughs> can I tell the Valentine's story? Because it makes me look bad, not you. Okay. <laughs> I got the consent. It's important. Um, <laughs> so anyways, when I entered into the relationship, I'll just give a little like background. Um, mm -hmm. I had just come out of a very long-term relationship. I was engaged to a woman. Um, it was not a good, healthy relationship. It was quite emotionally abusive. Um, she ended up having an affair for six months. And anyways, I called off the engagement, ended the relationship. I think previously I had been more securely attached, but after going through all of that and the, yeah, just the emotional abuse, the gaslighting, I became a lot more avoidant because I had a really hard time trusting and opening up to other people um and can i ask yeah i just a really quick question like did um did it feel like things were all sort of crashing down quite quickly or was it like just a really long decline in in hindsight it was a really long decline i think in the moment it seemed very sudden um mm. but we definitely had issues for a long time probably since day one um that we just weren't good at communicating about um yeah. So then when I met Cass, I was actually quite emotionally unavailable. I wasn't really ready to enter into a relationship, but I really, really liked her. I had had a crush on her for literally years. Um, and when she asked me to be her girlfriend and to be exclusive, I was like, well, I don't want to pass up this opportunity for something that could be amazing. Even if like deep down, I'm like, I'm not ready for this. Um, so I think that presented a lot of challenges in our relationship in the early days um, because I was, you know, pushing her a little uh, away a little bit and, and creating that distance. And um, it, she noticed that and I think was trying to like pull me in and, and reel me in. So, yeah, the Valentine's story is I in my previous relationship, we didn't celebrate Valentine's Day. Like my partner was too cool for it, whatever. It's a commercial holiday. I'm pretty neutral on on the holiday, but um, I just kind of assumed that Cass would also be like too cool, not into it, whatever. So when she asked me if we're doing something for Valentine's, I was like, no, nah, like, I don't know. I don't have any plans. Do you? And she's like, oh, we'll I have an improv workshop. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll just go home. I'll have a self-care night, whatever. Um, and then, so I order myself some takeout. I'm watching Netflix in bed. And then I get a text from her and she was just like, so I didn't go to my workshop. Um, and then I guess was waiting for me to be like, okay, come over. Like, let's spend Valentine's together. But I was like, oh, cool. Have a great night. <laughs> like, just didn't respond, mm. <laughs> which was not the right thing to do. So then she lives a 10 minute walk away. 10 minutes later, there's a knock on my door and she shows up crying. And <laughs> I think was expecting me to be like, hey, like, let's spend time together. It's Valentine's. Um, so that was, yeah, that was a bit like a bit of a pivotal moment in our relationship because I was like oh this person is actually serious about this she wants to be with me she wants to spend time with me she values this relationship um, maybe I should also reciprocate that so we had a lot of conversations after that a lot of processing and working through and the following week we had like our own little valentine celebration um, but yeah that was <laughs> we had the anxious partner and the avoidant partner and <laughs> It all just blew up. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, wow. I love that story. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think like if I have follow-up questions, uh, what would you say are like the classic ways that you would create distance in a relationship? Because I probably will relate to a lot of them. Yeah. I think one of them is like just being fiercely independent, like, never asking for help, never asking for somebody to meet my needs, doing everything for myself, often 
doing everything for the other person too, whether they want me to or not. Um, yeah. And I was also just like very guarded and closed off and wouldn't like be super vulnerable and share things about myself that I thought could like potentially be used against me. Um, wow. Yeah. I would never say I love you first. I would wait until I knew how they felt. I just like feared that rejection. I didn't even want to like put myself out there. Wow. So, yeah. I don't know if you can relate to any of that. But. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely the one of like doing things for myself and doing things for the other person. I think that's like a huge sensitive spot for me. Um, yeah, because it's both. Yeah, it's both wanting that independence and also like yeah, just not really trusting the other person. Um, and we did a big chat about avoidance in the last episode. And I also experience a lot of avoidance as resentment. Um, so it's like, just, I, I'm doing all these things. I'm doing all this work, but like, I, I really like, I want to be thanked for it, but I also wasn't asked to do any of that work. So it's just like a whole bunch of mind reading and like, yeah, bad news. Yeah. 100%. I feel that. Yeah, like yeah. wanting to be appreciated for things that nobody asked you to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I think like uh, as far as like communication strategies for like, um, yeah. Oh, man. Okay. I have a question. I just have so many questions <laughs> <laughs> with like, uh, okay, so would you say it's easier to like listen to your partner talk about their feelings versus talk about your own feelings yes definitely I mean I'm a therapist in training so that's like, <laughs> that's what I do <laughs> um yeah yes yeah, same same I think yeah toward the end of my last relationship it it had become that where we were in like the dead of COVID and I was taking on like so much of my ex's feelings and not really talking about my own or like processing my own in a realistic way. And like there was maybe one moment where I like had an actual like catharsis and had to like cry it out of like, yeah, COVID sucks. Like I miss my friends. Like all this shit is really bad. Um, we're just like trapped here with each other. <laughs> um, that kind of thing. But I still, I still avoided having the discussion of like larger incompatibilities that we were having, yeah. um, which uh, I still regret. And like, that is, um, how would I phrase it? It's just a like goal I have for myself to just never do that again. Like it just didn't serve me to like hide in that way, mm -hmm. you know? Um, when you feel avoidant, like, do you generally feel quite neutral or do you feel like you're bottling things up? I think that's a good question. I think when times are tough, I will distract myself by focusing on other people's problems, concerns, issues, like whatever's going on for them and just not even acknowledge what's going on for me. So I think, yes, I am bottling it up but I'm not realizing that in the moment. And then, yeah. um, I don't know if you do the same thing, but when times are tough, I just like focus all my energy on the other person mm. rather yeah. than actually like processing what's going on internally. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great way to put it because like my experiences with depression from around like 2013 to 2017 maybe um, were largely that where like I wasn't, it wasn't, it just wasn't clear to me, like how depressed I was. I was like, oh, doesn't everybody just kind of like hate doing stuff and like not get along with people and like have a low self-concept and like constant like self-criticisms and all these things? Like, isn't that just, isn't that just part of life kind of thing? Like I just got so accustomed to it. And so I would stay, I stayed in like an animation job, like really like beating myself into the ground, um, not not realizing like I didn't have to do that, you know? Um, and I would say that's like a very avoidant thing to do of like getting into like an awful situation mm -hmm. and then just like staying in it and not really like advocating for myself or like checking in with myself to say like, this feels bad. This feels really bad. <laughs> like I don't have to feel bad <laughs> all the time, you know? Is that like, have you had experiences like that at all? Oh, totally. And that actually brings up a good point. Like even just like workaholism, like just throwing yeah. yourself into your work. That is an avoidance tactic, which yeah. I have been famous for historically. So, mm. 
Mm. Yeah. 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 That's really fair. Cause like, uh, wow. I'm surprised. I don't think I've said this on the podcast, but I have really had to train myself to just say like, my work is not my worth as a human being. Mm -hmm. Like there are people who like me just because I don't have to prove anything, but like, I didn't grow up in an environment where that was the standard. Like the yeah. standard was achievement based and like whatever credential based and always like checking in, like how are your grades? Like, uh, you know, how are the sports going? Like it was very competitive in the household as well. And all of that just like feeds into that, like workaholic mindset. Um, do you relate to any of that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, in my household growing up, I had very, I don't know, my parents were living their own lives. They weren't like, didn't put any pressure on us whatsoever or give okay. us any guidance. Um, but my brother and I are both very competitive and competitive with each other. Like we just have these self-imposed standards um, mm. of success and achievement. And so we're both very driven in that way. And I've had to do the same thing of just like, reminding myself that, yeah, you can just let go of that. Like you're, you're, st you still have value as a human, even if you're not constantly being productive, constantly achieving, earning money, um, doing all those things, but it's hard to let go of. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Cause like I'm at a place right now because I mean, we're all looking for that sweet spot, right. Of like being engaged by life, but not being like stressed out and like just freaked out by life because we're working so hard. Um, because like on the total other end of the spectrum is like completely like disengaging and like not doing anything at all. Like it's, it's hard, right? Because we're just, we're in like a capitalist yeah. system. That's like, you that gotta really do rewards stuff. That. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, dang. Yeah. At uh, the beginning of my program, I was working full time, 40 hours a week and also doing a full course load. So I was spending like 13 hour days in front of the computer on zoom because all the classes were on zoom and it just, yeah. it wasn't sustainable. I was so unhappy. So now I'm not working at all. I do like occasional background work just to try yeah. to make ends meet, even though it doesn't really pay the bills at all. But just letting go of that was a really hard step being like, Oh, I don't have an income. I'm not contributing to society and I have to be okay with that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, um, again, feel free not to answer, but like, was that was that feeling of like letting go and relying on your partner a very difficult step as well? Yeah, I mean, like I still am not relying on her financially. Luckily, I had some savings so I can like still okay. stay, still take care of that side of things. But I think even just admitting like I need something's got to give. I've got to take a break. Um, I'm not capable of juggling all of this. Um, I think that was the hardest part. Mm. Yeah, wow. just like admitting when I needed help. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about this literally today, like this morning. <laughs> I mentioned to Sasha off mic, I had a very emotional week and I'm just like, just doing a lot of journaling, a lot of like checking in and being like, wow, what, what's going on, David? What are we thinking about? Because um, with, so for me, I was talking about resentment earlier um, and like doing things for the other person. Uh, and you talked also with like anxious attachment styles, there's like that need for like constant reassurance um, or, you know, almost constant reassurance <laughs> <laughs> to an avoidant type. It feels so constant, <laughs> but like um, for me, I was like, why does that bother me? Like, why is it hard to have to repeat myself, like repeat that I love the person, repeat that I value that person. And like, the more I thought about it, I was like, maybe it's just that I just feel insulted. Like, I feel like, oh, did you ignore me all those other times? Like, is is the times that I said it not good enough for you? Like, yeah. and all it like, all it comes back to is like, not good enough. Like the story of insecurity is like the story of not good enough. Would you agree? I am relating so much to what you're saying right now. And <laughs> I don't know if you're like familiar into love languages, but I'm just curious what mm -hmm. your love language is. I'm um, words of affirmation, touch, and uh, I'll always take some quality time. Nice. Yeah. How about you? Um, I really like physical touch and Cass is very into words of affirmation. So being more of an anxious partner and constantly needing that reassurance and also words of affirmation, I would be like, but my actions are, are telling you everything you need to know. Like I'm, mm. I'm affectionate. I'm doing things for you. Like, isn't that enough? And it would drive me crazy a little bit, mm. but we've, we've talked about that and we've had a lot of conversations about what we need 
in regards to our love languages so yeah <laughs> yeah and that's that's huge right like i i had that experience with my dad a lot because his is gift giving and i just don't get it um because also he he doesn't give great gifts like he, he will give like surprise gifts and like it's not anything anybody asked for so it's like there's a whole other layer to that but um i would get these gifts and i would be like disappointed i would be like almost like annoyed with him and then like as i've gotten older i'm like that's kind of the best he can do like mm -hmm. for him like he's you know he's a retired man he's worked all his life um he still loves his family but like he really struggles with showing it because of how he grew up and so if he wants to give gifts like it's kind of on me to see that that's how he is like showing love as opposed to me trying to get him to change that you know yeah and, and people often show their love in the way that they like to receive it yeah so maybe that's how crumbs <laughs> he's trying to pull my headphones out <laughs> If that's how he was used to his parents showing their affection or his partners or whatever, then maybe that's all he knows. Um, my yeah. ex was very much the same way. It's just like gift giving was her only love language. But I was like, that's not what I need. I need touch. I need words of affirmation. I need quality time. Like, I appreciate this, but like, you're just like missing the point here. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, for me, I'm just like, oh, it's just stuff. Like, I have <laughs> enough stuff. <laughs> I get very like, I feel like, yeah, every once in a while, I'll, like, be talking about something on my wish list or, like, a piece of tech that I'm looking for. But I don't know. Yeah, right now, it, that's, it's not on the top of my list. Yeah. Um, so to uh, wrap up this discussion, I'm just going to give two book recommendations. I already said at the top, Attached by Amr Levine and Rachel Heller. I also want to recommend Addiction, Attachment, Trauma, and Recovery by Oliver J. Morgan. Um, that book could probably get its whole episode because it covers so much stuff. Um, because in Morgan's view, like he feels that a lot of just like global dysfunction and like, um, but particularly like addiction and traumas and all of that stuff, like the way to healing is by focusing on attachment based therapies. Um, because like in his view, he's like, this is the only way like humanity is going to survive. It's like people have to care about each other. Like, why don't we <laughs> see that? Um, so it's a fascinating book. Did you read it or like, are you just aware of it? Sasha? I'm aware of it. I haven't read it. Okay. Um, another good one. This isn't specifically to do with attachment, but they do mm -hmm. talk about attachment relationships as a point of intervention. Um, the Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. It's cool. very popular right now. I think it came out in 2014, um, but that one's also... Um, very well written has a lot of good information and kind of touches on that as well um i think there's nice. a big addictions portion in there too nice um yeah i started reading it and uh i got anxious reading it so i yeah. had to put it down <laughs> it seemed pretty heavy it was talking about like um ptsd and like war yeah. stuff yeah it's like oh wow yeah not ready for that um wow okay so that concludes our chat on attachment we are now at the fun of the show with Sasha, and we are going to play Two Truths and a Lie, the famous game where each of us have two truths and one lie, and we are going to try to guess what each is. Um, so do you want to guess first, Sasha, or do you want to uh, have me guess first? Ooh, I'll guess first. All right. So here are my statements. I have used nude broadcasting websites for fun. I have five siblings. And my favorite kind of music is ska. <laughs> and you can ask as many questions as you want. <laughs> Who's your favorite ska artist? Uh, Real Big Fish. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, what are your five siblings' names? Chris, John, Liz, Vicky, and Alex. What's the birth order of those siblings? Oh, the birth order is starting from oldest. There's John, Chris, Liz. Myself, then Vicky, then Alex. Okay, seems legit. Um, which nude broadcasting sites are you interested in? Uh, mostly Chatterbait, but I have also used OnlyFans. Okay. I kind of feel like ska is not your favorite genre. <laughs> is that your final answer? I think so, yeah. 
Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you are correct. It is not my favorite kind of music. I haven't listened to ska uh, in like 10 years, probably. Yeah. Um, so Does well No done. Doubt count as ska? Uh, yeah, I think 90s, No Doubt. Well, maybe all of their career is ska, I guess. Okay, maybe I like like a little bit of ska, but that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, Spiderweb is great, or Spiderwebs. <laughs> yeah. That's like the main one that I know. Um, amazing. Uh, and we are, we're just going to breeze past my discussion of nudes. Uh, Sasha, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so I once fractured my skull, nose, and cheekbone when a patio umbrella fell on me when I was 14. Uh, I once served ice cream to Haley Wickenheiser from uh, the Canadian women's hockey team. Okay. And uh, in high school, I also called my orthodontist pretending to be my mom and got my braces off six months early. Okay. Um, with the uh, skull, nose, and cheekbone fracture, uh, what did you say fell on you? Patty umbrella. Okay. Uh, what material was the umbrella made out of? So the umbrella part was canvas and then the rest was metal. It was one of those like bolt down ones, but it hadn't been bolted down. Okay. And so did you have to wear a face cast? I didn't, but I swelled up and I looked like Elephant Man for like two weeks. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, when you served ice cream to this hockey player. I realized that season? you're American. So I was like, I should probably uh -huh. tell you who that is. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah, I already forget the name. <laughs> um, when you served ice cream to them, did uh, what? what season of the year was it? It was either summer or fall. I was working at Ernest Ice Cream, the one on Quebec Street. So we would get a lot of a lot of everybody coming in through there. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, what is your best impression of your mom's voice? What does she sound like? Oh, my God. She said something really funny the other day. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's only funny to me. But uh, <laughs> I would make a great surgeon. That's my best impression of my mom. And that's something I should. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And you were how old when you got these braces off? Probably 18. Okay. Did the braces have anything to do with the fracture like that you had gotten? No, I was just a late okay. bloomer and I never lost all my baby teeth. So when I was oh. 15, I got a bunch pulled and got my braces put on. <laughs> oh. And not wow, a fun really age to have braces this. on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You kind of want them in middle school, <laughs> not late high school. Um, wow, you're really good at this. Uh, okay, I'm gonna say that I'm gonna say that you did not have a skull, nose, and cheekbone fracture when you were 14. I Final did. Oh. I know. You okay, can't tell. What was the lie? <laughs> <laughs> I did not serve ice cream to Haley Wickenheiser, oh. but Olympic figure skater Patrick Chan. I did serve ice cream to him. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Wait, what does he uh what does he look like? Let me just uh <laughs> He's got eyes like this, like very right? intense. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I just find figure skaters are often very beautiful, so I just wanted to see. <laughs> he was lovely. He paid in fifties yeah. for his like ten dollar ice cream. So Wow. Okay. <laughs> Tipped well. Yeah, nice. lovely human. <laughs> Aw. All right, so that's a resounding victory to Sasha for two truths and a lie. Um, I mean, I guess you're just better at lying. Is that a skill that you want to have? <laughs> sure, yeah, it's useful. <laughs> um, wow, okay, uh, that was that was it. That like flew by. <laughs> um, that brings us to the end of today's show. So Sasha, what do you have any like takeaways about attachment theory just from like our chat here? Um. I think it was really interesting hearing your firsthand perspective as somebody who identifies as being more like disorganized, because um, I actually haven't encountered many people who, who have identified that in themselves. So that was really cool. I also learned that I need to learn how to speak more eloquently about attachment theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No worries. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I feel like... Uh... You know, I feel like as I continue to pursue dating, there will be more stories in the future of my disorganized tendencies. Um, because like, you know, my uh, we did a hookups episode that I think I, I sent to you um, where we talked about like, you know, how I handle slash 
can't handle hookups um because like attraction is such a like dicey thing for me that um yeah i think without a like i don't know without like a really secure like base of some kind like some sort of social circle some kind of like thing that's happening in my life um that keeps my mind off of dating and like hookups and stuff i just obsess i can just Mm. obsess and like on and on and on um even if it was just like a one-time thing with this person to the point where like I just wouldn't want to pursue a hookup with someone I found really attractive because it would just be like, it's just hard for me. It just like takes me like a week to recover as opposed to actually like enjoying it. Oh, wow. um, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm okay with that now. <laughs> like I don't have to keep pursuing that. <laughs> um, and anyway, so my takeaway for, uh, for this chat on attachment is the early childhood experiences stuff. Um, yeah, I think just that, just that thing of like babies are taking in everything about their environment is like I like I almost wish it weren't true because it would make it a little bit easier to like take care of babies but like um it's so important to think about like when planning pregnancies and like families and stuff of like what is the household that this baby is coming into because mm-hmm. they're it's gonna follow them they're, the they're gonna have stuff seems so high but i mean we could have yeah. talked about it in so much more detail oh yeah um, but the good thing is also like children are really resilient and even if their primary caregivers are not the most secure attachment base like often older siblings or a neighbor or a teacher or a grandparent will fill that void and they can still grow up to be securely attached adults so yes parenting is really hard and it can suck (laughs) and there are definitely repercussions. So don't neglect your child, but (laughs) kids can bounce back. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah, that's so true. That's great. Robert said the same thing when we were talking about, um, I think we were talking about the inner child in one of the episodes. Uh, that's lovely. And, uh, that, that I had similar experiences too. Like my parents were not the most emotionally available people, but my older brother was. And so he, very often like took on a um guardian role like as i was growing up and like as well as coming out and all of those experience all of those experiences um yeah i was very much that person for my younger brother and then um my best friend lived next door growing up we shared a backyard and her mom became my attachment figure so wow yeah yeah we all just we find a way to make it work (laughs) Thanks again to Sasha for coming on. You can follow her at Sasha.Rockcliffe on Instagram. And thank you for listening to Tissues of the Day. You can follow me, David, at BitButton on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow Robert in absentia uh, at Robert F. Mackay on Instagram. Subscribe to BitButton on YouTube and turn on notifications if you want to see what we're making. Finally, if you love this show, you can donate at Patreon.com slash BitButton. Stay wet, internet. <laughs>